because I have that pride. I'm a Muhammad and I'm proud of it. Just sorry I didn't ask them about their heritage and that, you know, what they'd done and where they worked. And it must have been hard. That probably gave Australia the lifeline to the outback. And without them, I don't know who would have opened the outback up. Everything was done by hand. And uh, they'd have a box there to help the big boxes up onto the side of the camels. And um, I think uh, their life was a, a pretty uh, strenuous one. Now, when the Afghans came, they, they charged very low freight rates. They walked the whole way. They got through when there was floods or drought. And so the Teamsters were very angry towards the Afghans. We fear a low, degenerate, mongrel race of human beings will follow where they lead. The term Afghan began to embody contempt, racial inferiority, uncleanliness, brutality, strangeness and fear in a white Australia. I don't know if they thought they would find themselves living on the edge of society because this was the, the rampant age of the white Australia policy and it was race that decided whether Australia would open its door to you or slam it in your face. Last of the lords of the desert, who carried out food and water on a string of 50 camels. Old Bijar de Verish, the giant Afghan, who fought the desert by compass and by Koran. Oh, Mr. Bijar, in the film Back of Beyond, he was just a gentleman and actually got to know his son Jack quite well. Mr. Bijar, I used to give him a wave whenever taking the mail out. I still say I wish I could have been a camel there. Their life, in my book, was a very tough one. Pop I came from Peshawar and came with uh, the camels, as did many other people who came from um, all sorts of different places and were collectively known as the Afghans. And uh, when he came, he had his own camels and um, in 1896, he actually went on the Calvert Expedition, which mapped out a lot of the territory of, um, especially around, uh, the Northern Territory and Western Australia. There's actually a hill called Bija Hill in Western Australia. I think we're both proud of what they've done and, um, you know, we continue on doing it. Uh, you know, researching and searching into it. It's as if, it's like as if there's a, although the family ties are not there, it's a bond and a common interest between the two of us that we've both got that something to be proud of and in our own little way we hang on to it. Well I think, I think his grandfather came from Afghanistan because he was always very interested in what went on near the Khyber Pass, you know. Any time there was any films on or anything, you've got to go and see them, yeah, yeah. Uh, he was in Western Australia. He was a camelier, as you know, with camels. Uh, my father was a, a big, strong man. He was six foot plus, you know, and well built. And, um, um, and he was a champion wrestler. And he taught my brothers how to wrestle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> plenty of camels, plenty of camel rides, yes, oh, yeah, when we were young. Yeah, my dad, my dad had a, um, this great big old wagon and he had the camels in the wagon. And when we were kids, we used to all stand and watch him and his mate wave our hands and they were going away with the, the camels in front and this old big old wagon behind. They used to go and then be away for a fair while and then come back with all the wool on top of the wagon. The bull camels was very wild, sort of, but the one my, ones my dad had, we, us kids used to have fun, you know.
Well, they had a couple of winners up in the Maori Cup. When they were young ones and just sitting down, we used to roll all over them and get used to them and that. And I used to watch the old man nose peg them, put the, put the big steel thing for the nose, and the old granddad used to do it. But camels, so they can get very nasty because we was out silvering them once and there was, and I used to drink a little bit of beer and there was a big camel, big bull camel tied up near the goalpost of the football oval. And I went up and I looked at him like that and he just went whack, like a bloke kicking the football, straight out and kicked me in the stomach. Oh, and down I went. He just he would, he had his camels and he used to do to, like to take the loading from Maori up to the Birdsville track and and and, and back with like the, with his with the camels and and it, it was, them days would be pretty hard, I suppose, wouldn't it, for them? Hmm. I don't think there's any, much difference at all, only that the Afghans lived in a different part of the town and, and the other people lived in the other part of the town. The food was uh, a little bit different. Like there's a, the curries and rice and stuff like that, and that uh, compared to the other, but the other uh, people ate around the place. They they had different types of food and that. But the Afghan food, we always had vegetables and and with the curry and and gear like that, and always had sweets. Pretty well. Pretty well much near the same apart from the hot curries. And... Look after the mosque and done all the prayers and and then they used to have a, a big charity night every Thursday night. They'd make a big curries up and all that stuff Thursday nights and a big get together and then when they started to die out in the 30s and 40s and that sort of all went out of circulation because by that time we was all working in the bush then, all us young fellas, and uh, there were seven boys and seven girls in the family and at present there's two girls and three boys. It's all that's left. My grandfather's B.J. Derbish. I was only seven years old when Granddad died uh, in 1957, but uh, he was just a leader of men. He was a really big man, very big, even till, you know, till the day he broke his hip before he passed away. Like, when we were kids those days, we, we didn't go around. We weren't allowed to go and sit in with the old men while they sat around the fire pot talking or having a... You were smoking the pipe or whatever, but, you know... We were sort of kept away from that, but in the work wise around the house and I remember Pop we used to kill he used to have to kill all the sheep around the place for because of the religion. But we were allowed to go there and help do that, catch a sheep, hang them up and things like that when we were I was only a kid as I said, but uh, I still remember doing those things, you know. And I know which way they they used to kill the sheep and what they used to pray and everything like that to kill the sheep, so They were young men with dreams. I go back as far as B.J. Dervish. He's my grandfather. Our ancestors opened up this country. And it was race that decided whether Australia would open its door to you or slam it in your face. We have to explain aspects of Islam for the rights of Muslims in this country. Time is precious. Each and every one of us will have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islam teaches us morals. We are Muslims and Australian Muslims. Islam is a religion of peace. This message was carried forward by the Prophet Muhammad 14 centuries ago. It reached the far corners of the globe, Europe, Africa, 
Central Asia, China and Southeast Asia. Islam was brought to the Indonesian archipelago by Arab sea merchants in the 14th century. Around the mid-16th century, more than 200 years before Europeans had arrived in Australia, Macassan sea traders sailed their mighty prahus to the north of Australia. It was through this early contact between Macassan traders and Aborigines that Islam was introduced to the local customs. However, it was not until the 1860s that Australia was to receive its first permanent community of Muslim migrants. When little was known about Australia's vast interior, camels were suggested as a solution to exploring the rugged Australian wilderness. Between 1860 and 1900, there was an estimated 3,000 Afghans living in Australia. They built telegraph lines which connected Australia with Britain, and they helped map out the interior of Australia on expeditions which named places like the Simpson Desert and Ayers Rock. The next major period of Muslim migration to Australia began in the 1950s with the Snowy Mountains Scheme. Many Albanians, Bosnians, Kosovans came to work on one of the largest hydroelectric projects in the world. There was now a sizeable Muslim population in Sydney and Melbourne. In 1964, the Australian Federation of Islamic Societies, AFIS, was established. AFIS officially changed its name to the Australian Federation of Islamic Councils in 1976. We were five, four people who were the main persons who helped me to establish IFIC. We would try to have some method that the Federation can get income. So that was there that we should start the halal meat. The Muslim community continued to grow and demands changed also. The need for schools, more mosques, halal butchers, restaurants and grocery stores grew. Today, the Muslim population of Australia is close to half a million people from over 100 different ethnicities. Well, through Islamic education, we can mould up the children's character and uh, to fit into this our own Australian society, but keeping their own identity that we are Muslims and Australian Muslims. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. In setting up community institutions and so on, all this requiring knowledge. Time is precious. Each and every one of us will have to answer Allah to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as to how we use our time. Well, basically it's morals, uh, you know, Islam teaches us morals, it teaches manners, and the Prophet Muhammad said al-Din al-Mu'amala, that religion is, is dealings. So we try to instill in the children these, uh, these, these meanings of love for one another, help one another, look after one another, um, uh, contribute, to, co contribute to the society that you live in. Their priorities are still in providing quality Islamic education, ensuring healthy halal products are available, and that Muslim needs are represented in the social, civil and political spheres. Muslims Australia has come a long way and grown with the Muslim community who have been there from the start and plans, with God's will, to be there for generations to come. <laughs>